Okay, so let me do this and the next five questions, six questions total, all together because they are relatively easy questions. So each one's going to be pretty short. So let me just start with that. Uh, let me just do them all together so that um, you know the, the resulting video is not too short. So this question says, suppose that an electron and a positron at rest, good, that makes things easier. They annihilate each other, answer it below two questions. Okay, so what you have is an electron and a positron at rest, and they're just gonna annihilate each other, pair annihilation, pair annihilation, yeah, I think, and produce two photons. It has to be two photons because, um, because that's the only way you can conserve momentum. If it's only one photon, can't conserve momentum. So when it asks how much energy is released, that's basically going to be your rest energy. So here the rest energy was basically the rest energy of the electron plus the rest energy of the positron. Each of them have 0.511 MeV of energy. It's one of the few numbers that I happen to have memorized. This is one of the reasons I like MeV units better, because that's the unit in which I have, um, oops, I have numbers memorized. So 1.022 MeV is how much energy should be released in uh, like total. So 1.022 MeV. So now it asks, which statement below most accurately describes how this energy may be released? Okay, it produced two photons, the is split between the two on a, ah, uh, it's not gonna be a spectrum of possible values because this is the total energy and with the two particle decay, um, it's like it, it, it constrains the energy of each particle, energy of this gamma ray photon to 0 0.11 MeV. There might be some spread for uncertainty in measurement, but other than that, no spectrum. So it has to produce at least two photons, each carrying equal amount of energy away. Yeah, I guess that's right. Um, now it says at least two. So you might ask, so could it produce three photons? Um, I think it could. Um, now it might be much rarer because two photon process would be the kind of the leading order in the perturbative calculation. But I don't think uh, um, three or four photon process is necessarily ruled out. There might be a reason, but you know, at least two. And if there are other things that uh, forbid um, multiple photons, then this is not actually at least the wrong statement. Um, so uh, I may produce a number of possible particle anti pairs in its release of energy. Um, oh, so you know, two photons are technically a particle anti particle pairs. But I think given the rest energy of the electron, the only possible pair it can produce is the photon. Because um, no, all the other particle-antiparticle pairs, like muon, antimuon, um, they all have more energy, so none of those can be produced. So, um, so unless by a number of possible particle-antiparticle pair, they mean, you know, uh, four photons, like, no, that's too weird. Uh, it, that's not correct. This is correct. Okay, the analysis can produce, to produce. Yeah, this is just uh, forbidden. Uh, momentum cannot be conserved in that way. So I think the second choice is the most correct one. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. The third one. Um, if this didn't exist, I might answer this. But this exists, so that's gonna be my answer. Okay, let's look at the next question in the set. That's question six. I don't think they are all, none of them are really going to be related. So I'll just erase everything. Yeah, question six. Um, it says, express the beta decays below in terms of beta decays of quarks by filling in the blanks with the correct words. Oh, okay. Check to see that the conservation loss for charge, left number, beta number, say it's that. The quark carries that. Oh, let me draw a Feynman diagram. That's going to be fun. So the process that they are describing is, um, so for part A, it's a neutron decaying into proton plus the uh, electron plus the electron anti-neutrino. And um, 
So to draw Feynman diagram for this process, you need to know the quark composition of the particles. Neutron is the uh, what I think of as isospin down particle, and that's a mnemonic for me to remember. Oh, it has more down quarks than up quarks. So it's gonna be up, down, down. Proton is the um, the opposite of a neutron in the sense of it's gonna be isospin up particle. So it'll have more up quarks than down quarks, up, up, down, um, and the rest is good. So that's one thing you have to know, the quark composition of these. And the other thing you have to know is the elementary vertex of, um, of the, uh, the weak interaction, which is the beta decay. The elementary vertex looks like this. It has a particle coming in and a particle going out. It could be an antiparticle coming in one or the other. So if this is, let's say, up, then this would be down. Or let me uh, arrange it this way. If this is down, then this could be up. Then um, in this interaction, in this elementary vertex, there's a force mediator connected to it, which would be one of the bosons. For the particle changing interaction, it will be a W boson. And you make the charge of it, make it so that the charge is conserved here. It would be W minus here. And this would technically be an anti quark that's coming in. And this is the elementary vertex, and you can kind of you know twist them, like a topologically, um, this process is allowed down quark coming in, up quark going out, along with the um, the virtual W boson. Uh, w minus, yeah, I think down W minus charge and up positive, I think it all works out. So like this is also kind of a elementary vertex. So with that in mind, um, I need to think of uh, how these things will connect. So... Um, so for the neutron, I have, um, let me represent them this way. Uh, I'm going to have two spectator quarks. So that'll be one of the up quarks that'll turn into one of the up quarks and one of the down quarks that'll turn into the one of the, the down quarks. And this is uh, one down quark turning into that up quark. That is the actual interaction. So, uh, so I'll have these two spectator quarks that don't really do anything in terms of you know, turning into other stuff. I mean, there's a strong interaction going on that's going to affect things. But other than that, uh, nothing from there. So this down quark will turn into kind of referring to this elementary vertex here. It'll turn into an up quark. And in the process of turning into an up quark, it'll emit a W boson. So that should be W minus, so that at this vertex, um, charge conservation is held. I have minus one third E coming in. I have plus two thirds E going out alongside minus E. Add this up, I get minus one third E. Now this uh, virtual W boson will quickly decay into particle-antiparticle pair of the electron and the uh, electron antineutrino. And at this vertex, charge is conserved, you know, negative charge going into negative charge of electron, and the lepton number is conserved. Electron has a plus one lepton number, and the electron antineutrino has minus one uh, lepton number. Okay, so that's the Feynman diagram that will inform the blanks that I'll fill in. So beta decay can be described by a decay of a, a down quark in the neutron into an up quark, in the proton. In this process, the decaying quark emits a, a whatly charged, uh, negatively, <laughs> negatively charged virtual W boson. This boson decays into a uh, electron and uh, two words. Antineutrino? Oh, uh, I know. Electron antineutrino. I think that's how it's supposed to be spelled and uh, which carry away the difference in energy. Okay, that seems right. Let's give it a try. Good. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's the process in A. Now let's look at the process in B, which is a beta plus decay. Um, can I make a use of what I've already written? You know, I think it's going to be too complicated. So let me just rewrite most of it. 
Um, all right, so we are still dealing with a weak interaction, which has an elementary vertex that looks like this. So um, this time, it's going to be a proton decaying into neutron plus positron plus the electron neutrino. And uh, you might, yeah, so um, if you're thinking, hey, proton cannot decay into neutron, yeah, you're right. That's what this note is for. <laughs> the proton has to be bound in a nucleus with other protons and neutrons then. It could decay into another isotope that contains more neutrons that has lower energy. So um, as with before, we have to know the quark composition. Proton has up, up, down quarks as the isospin up particle. Neutron has up and down, down quarks as uh, the isospin down particle. And um, so let me try to draw this out. So I have uh, three quarks coming in. One of the quarks will probably change into other stuff. Two of the quarks will be spectator quarks. So I can say one of the up quark will just be up quark going out. One of the down quarks will be the down quark going out. So I have an up quark that's turning into a down quark. So an up quark that's uh, turning into a down quark. And in the process, it should be emitting a W boson. That kind of looks like it here. Now, what I have to make sure is that the charge conservation is held. So an up quark has a plus two thirds E of charge. That's going to turn into minus one third E of uh, charge for down quark. So this W boson must have a positive charge, plus E, so that these two added together adds to this. So this positively charged W boson will now decay into the particle-antiparticle pair. The particle in this case will be the neutrino, that's the particle, and the antiparticle in this case will be the positron, which is an antiparticle. It has a lepton number of minus 1, the neutrino has lepton number of plus 1. Good, so I think that's the process. Uh, let's uh, fill in the blanks. The beta plus decay can be described by a decay of an up quark into the down quark. In the process, the decaying quark emits a positively charged virtual W boson. This boson decays into, um, the first is one word, so that must be positron. And the second is, um, Two words, which must be electron neutrino, which carry away the difference in energy. Yeah, good. Yeah, so that's the uh, that's question six. Um, just describing these uh, beta decay processes in terms of the elementary particles that make up the 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 baryons that are involved in the beta decay. Okay, uh, we are on question seven. Uh, let me see if it's a similar question. Nah. <laughs> Clear everything. Okay, so the question 7 asks, the neutral pion most commonly decays into two photons in this reaction. What is the energy of each photon produced in the decay of neutral pion at rest? Uh, to conserve more, oh yeah, yeah I was going to say you could have guessed that, but question also told you. Also, uh, all you have to do is you can take the rest energy of the neutron pion Divided by two, that'll give you the energy of the photons. I'm pretty sure that's what the hint will say. And, oh yeah, you know, what I would recommend is to use the Particle Data Group website. The hint will take you to the 22 table. And you can actually go to the website directly. It's uh, pdg.lbl.gov. It's their Particle Data Group website. They are the keeper of the data, most commonly referred data in particle physics. So um, you can use the summary tables or those. Um, you can also use the interactive listing, which might be a little bit easier to use on a phone or on web browser. So I'm looking for the property of pion. So uh, I have leptons, quarks, uh, mesons. There it is. Uh, pion is a light, unflavored meson. And yeah, this charged pion, which I don't want. I want neutral pion. Because they will have slightly different uh, mass because of their differences in the interaction. So the neutral pion has mass of 134.9. Let me write that down. I think I'm going to. So mass of the neutral pion is 
let me say 9.8 MeV in the C equals 1 unit. So the energy of the photon must be that divided by 2, which is going to be, can I do this in my head, 60, um, 7 point, uh, I want to say 49. So if I take 67.49 and double it, I'll get, yeah, I think I get that. So photons each have this much energy. That's a pretty high energy gamma ray photon. Uh, most uh, gamma ray sources, like radioactive isotopes, I don't think any of them have this much energy. Like a mega electron volts, a couple mega electron volts is what I'm used to seeing in the gamma ray sources. I don't know if there's any that has that much energy. Uh, it, it, it might be super unstable. So yeah, that's this question. As I said, a quick, nice and short. All you need is some particle property. So the next question is question eight. Uh, Slack. Uh, National Acceleration Laboratory was designed to collide electrons and positrons as center of momentum energy of that, uh, which was high when they were making it. Now it's kind of small. I think they are still using it because for linear collider, it's still the highest energy linear collider, I think. Um, there's something called the International Linear Collider that somebody's building. But um, anyways, um, for producing and studying Z boson. The wavelength of a 45, and G boson has a mass of like 80 GeV or something, I think. Um, so, you know, that's really what this energy is meant to reach. Uh, I guess, uh, I don't know if they knew the mass of the G boson before they built it. Um, uh, maybe, they, they might have. I, I don't, know. don't ask me particle physics history when I'm a terrible historian to... Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the particle physics isn't really my field. <laughs> Wavelength of the 45 GeV electron used by gives an idea of the length scale it is able to probe. Ah, okay. What is the wavelength of the... Yeah, so um, here what I'm going to be using is uh, what we covered way back in chapter... I want to say chapter 6, um, the de Broglie relationship, which says the momentum of a quantum mechanical thing is given by its uh, Planck constant, well, not its, just Planck constant, divided by its wavelength. Or, turning it around, wavelength of a quantum mechanical thing is uh, given by Planck constant divided by momentum of the thing. So all you have to do is take Planck constant, divide by the momentum that we are given, and that will give us the wavelength. So this is the kind of calculation I can do super easily in a O from alpha. So let me do it that way. So in O from alpha, I can do this calculation. Planck's constant divided by... Now, if I do simply 40, 45 GeV, you'll find that uh, it, that doesn't give you what we are looking for. Because when we say 45 GeV electron, we are really referring to its uh, um, energy. And so you have to have it in correct unit of momentum, uh, which is... Um, that divided by C. So you have to put in correct factors of C in order to have the correct unit. So that's the correct factor of C. If I were looking for something like a mass, it would have been C squared. But um, here, it's just GV divided by C. So that will have correct unit of momentum. So it will give me stuff in the momentum constant. Why does it keep doing C squared? Uh, let me do it this way. 45 divided by C. Wait, is that right? Um, no, so it'll be 45 GeV. Uh, let me do it this way. I'll do division by C on the outside. That way um, it doesn't, you know, all from alpha doesn't hurt it. It's a pretty little head <laughs> thinking about what is GeV over C. It might not have that as a programmed in as a unit, but this is a calculation you can literally do. So doing that literal calculation, you get something in the unit of length, and you get, oh, yeah. So let me just type that in. 2.755 times 10 to the power of minus 17 meters. That's a small enough scale that whatever prefixes that is for, I don't have it memorized. There might be a prefix for it. I think ATO is, uh, oh, no, no, FEMTO is a 10 to the minus 15, I think. So ATO is a 10 to the minus 18. 
So let me, so it, this is probably like a 27 attometer uh, in attometer. Yeah, yeah, so I, I do have a prefixes memorized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know what's smaller than Atto. Atto is a, literally my limit of uh, memorized prefixes. Okay, so that's question eight. Uh, let me go to question 11. Uh, and I think I'll use O from Alpha still, but I think I don't need what I've written down before. So if uh, some amount of energy is released in an annihilation of a sphere of matter and antimatter, and the spheres are equal mass, <laughs> what are the masses of the spheres? Okay. So this is how much rest energy there must have been. So I guess uh, what I would say is the, the rest energy of one of them is going to be 3.6 times 10 to the 30 MeV divided by 2, which should be equal to the mass of the thing times the C squared. So um, so the we are looking for what mass it was. So it's that energy divided by 2 divided by C squared. So let me do that. So 3.6 times 10 to the power of 30 <laughs> MeV. I have no number sense for how big that is, how small that is. I have a sense that's not a macroscopic amount of energy, but we'll see. That divided by C squared. Um, yeah, I think it's just that. Uh, and it'll probably give me, yeah, you need 6 point, wow, that's a macroscopic amount of mass. So I guess that must be macroscopic amount of energy. Um, Wait, did I get something wrong? Um, oh, I forgot to divide by two. So divide by two. Um, yeah, it's three point. I, I could have done that here. <laughs> I'm surprised by getting wrong answer. Yeah, that's a macroscopic amount of mass. So I guess uh, let me just uh, ask. Uh, so that in joules, how much energy is that? Uh, oh yeah, that is a large amount of joules um, in megatons of TNT. That's like nuclear bomb. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a, like amount of energy in a thermonuclear bomb, like a, a fusion bomb. So yeah, that's uh, so you know in thermonuclear bomb. Um, I think you have a more amount of reaction mass than that because that's how much uh, material has to disappear. Uh, so, um, yeah. yeah. Anyways, <laughs> uh, let me not go down into rabbit hole and finish up this set of six questions with question 13, which is our last question here. And uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's a cosmology question. So I do know um, this has uh, something to do with the Hubble constant. And, oh, you know what? I have all from alpha, so I think I can actually do it this way. So there is uh, something called the Hubble's law. And this is a kind of um, fundamental relationship that's not too hard to memorize. So Hubble's law, Hubble who discovered, depending on who you ask, but he's the one we named the law after, who discovered um, that the universe is expanding. Now, there are a couple of people who deserve that the credit better than Hubble, but let's just say Hubble discovered it. Um, so his law says there's a linear relationship. How quickly something is receding, um, um, like extra galactic, faraway object is receding from us. There's a relationship between that and its distance. Um, so that the receding speed is proportional to the distance. And whenever you have uh, proportionality, the way you can go farther and get an express relationship of equality for is to introduce a constant. And that constant is the Hubble constant. Don't know if it's called H naught, but let's say this. So um, if we have the distance of the galaxy, 
and um, Wolfram Alpha presumably knows about Hubble constant. Then all I have to do is Hubble constant times that distance, 163 MPC. Let's say that I don't even know that this stands for megaparsec. <laughs> Let's see what Wolfram Alpha gives me. If it doesn't give me something reasonable, then I'll go look up the text book and yeah, but it knows Hubble, par Hubble parameter, okay. And uh, megaparsecs, yeah, it knows that. Gives me that speed, wow, that is fast. Um, so kilometers per second, so that's uh, 11,000 kilometers per second. Yeah, that's not quite speed of, what did I get wrong? Um, did it round off too much? It's possible that uh, your textbook uses a different value of a Hubble parameter. Because that should be incorrect, right? Um, let's look at your textbook value, actually. I'm um, sorry. I'll probably edit the question so that when you click on it, um, yeah. when you when you click on it, um, it, 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 um, it opens a new window. But let me do control click. And let's see what your textbook thinks is a Hubble parameter. It thinks the Hubble parameter is a 70 kilometer per second per megapark set. Okay. All right. We'll just use that. 70 kilometer per second per uh, MPC. So doing that calculation, I get 11.41. Yeah, all right. Uh, let me put in 11.41. Actually, 11,41. <laughs> so that should be graded as correct. Good. And let me actually go in and fix up the question so that um, fix up two things. I think uh, it should have a much wider tolerance, like, uh, I don't know. 20% tolerance because this uh, uh, kind of a parameter it probably it, it you know it gets updated so if, uh, if we're just looking for Hubble parameter I'm sure the most recent value is not 70 kilometers per second like 68 kilometers per second per MPC so uh, so this needs greater tolerance and I need to fix up this link so that it opens a new window so let me go in and do that but I can do that off uh, recording um, so, so I'll do that after this ends. So this is our sixth question in this sixth question set um, that concludes all the questions for our, our problem set 15. Thank you. Let me know of any questions and.